Lion King is allegory. You know, I think all good animation at its best is allegory for us as human beings. The story connects itself to primal stories. You're entering into that world that has always dealt with large basic principles and basic abstracts. The more you try to make it authentic and true and deeper and more resonant, the more it's going to be like the great myths that have endured and that resonate now. These are fundamental elements of the human experience. Betrayal, redemption, fitting in, family, community. We knew that there was a kind of epic or religious epic quality to it, something like Ben-Hur or, you know, uh, Moses. Old Testament tales like Joseph or like Moses. They're great old stories and there's a reason they've stayed around for a couple thousand years is because they have some resonance to us even today. So symbolically and mythically, all those stories resonate in a really uh, twisted new way. You know, they're spun on their ear, they're told in a way that doesn't evoke Moses when the audience sees it. The idea of a character like Joseph who grows up in virtual royalty and then is banished to return, you know, years later unrecognized by his family is, you know, really inspiration. Simba, you're alive? How can that be? It doesn't matter. I'm home. That we can relate to them and say, well, if Moses saw the burning bush and got wisdom from it, why can't Simba see the burning bush in the form of Mufasa, his father, and get an inspirational message from that? You are my son and the one true king. Because we were intentionally trying to work in the realm of archetypes, I think then, as soon as you do that, then you start to see how it relates to other, other great mythological stories. Whether it's scholars like, like Bettelheim in Uses of Enchantment, or uh, of course Joseph Campbell and his analysis of the hero's journey, even more contemporary versions of primal tales like the, the Shakespearean angle, of course the, the Hamlet angle get, that gets talked about. We took in all of that as we began to shape the story. Wow! Before I came aboard, it was described as Bambi in Africa with Hamlet thrown in, so Bamblet. I think we noticed that there were similarities after we had structured certain things. Because originally Scar was a rogue lion that didn't have anything to do with the pride. And then we thought, well, it would be more interesting if the threat comes from within. As the king's brother, you should have been first in line. Well, I was first in line until the little hairball was born. And then, all right, so if it's a royal family, then what's more threatening than to have someone in the royal family be the threat? And then, you know, you made him the brother, and all of a sudden, uh-oh, here's, uh, you st we started seeing the Hamlet parallels. Don't turn your back on me, Scar. Oh, no, Mufasa. Perhaps you shouldn't turn your back on me. The Shakespearean element, to me, is not only the bad uncle and the would-be prince, it's also the juxtaposition of the tragedy with the next Jesus. scene is hysterical. Kid, what's eating you? Nothing. He's at the top of the food chain. <laughs> we wanted to represent it as a tragedy that was hopeful. The idea of a character who goes through a traumatic event and somehow has to deal with that on the screen was fascinating to us. There were days when we went more down the Hamlet path than other days. There were moments when we had lines of Shakespeare into the, you know, into the movie. We had, um, you know, Scar throwing Mufasa off of the parapet in, uh, into the stampede saying, good night, sweet prince, and, you know, things like that. And it became too kind of self-conscious. And so the, what's left is kind of the echoes of Hamlet. The question is, who are you? We'd all decided that there needed to be a to be or not to be scene. And it was the very last scene that was created for the movie, which is after Mufasa visits Simba and leaves, Simba's left wondering what to do. No, please, don't leave me. And that literally became our to be or not to be moment. And then everything after that became about being as good as that scene and, and really trying to bring the whole movie up to that level. One of the interesting things in the process, I think, is sort of finding the theme. Sometimes you go through these kind of soul-searching times where you begin to question, is this really our theme? Is there another theme emerging? I think from very early on, we were going to take on the telling of a story about coming of age. And because it was about kingship, 
It was the taking of responsibility. One day, Simba, the sun will set on my time here and will rise with you as the new king. In this case, the story was telling you that it wanted to tell itself about responsibility. The metaphor of, of how are you responsible for your own community or how are you responsible in your own family. And I think that's something that's universal that people can relate to and I, and I think it's always appropriate. And whether that is expressed as loyalty, whether it's ex expressed as taking your place in the circle of life, this notion that Simba takes responsibility for himself and realizes that although he's made mistakes, he must go back. Rather than checking out of life, because life is too hard, he chooses to actually go do something that's much more life-affirming. It was very important to embody that theme about taking responsibility and about the defining moment that happens when you choose to stand up. And we were talking about how are we going to teach the lesson? How are we going to convey it? And then Irene, as a joke, said, why doesn't he just hit him over the head? Ow! Jeez, what was that for? It doesn't matter. It's in the past. And that's one of those times where, you know, the crazy idea becomes the great idea. You think you have a theme, and as the movie pulls together, it becomes more apparent in each scene. We wanted to not skirt the issue of death because it was essential to the story. It's the big story that everybody deals with, which is about dealing with life in the face of death. Simba, let me tell you something that my father told me. Look at the stars. The great kings of the past look down on us from those stars. Really? Yes. So whenever you feel alone, just remember that those kings will always be there to guide you. And so will I. Life is about balances, and it's the contrast of it all makes it work. The sun only shines in contrast to the darkness. So the brighter you want the movie to be, the more celebratory and joyous you want it to be, you have to, at times, go into the darkness and show that side of the movie. You had to deal with the bottom rung of life in terms of loss to be able to celebrate the last scene of all the gain that this character goes through by experiencing the full spectrum of life from joy to sorrow and from hopes to hurts and all that spectrum is, is what we tried to follow and lay out for the audience. So it sort of goes beyond the quotation marks of storytelling and it speaks to experience. It doesn't matter how bad things are or can get, you can get through it and the human spirit can rise above everything. The strength of uh, animation and certainly the team of artists that made Lion King is that together we made something that not one of us could have done on our own and that is a very magical thing and I think that's what the magic of Lion King is. We are all part of something bigger than us, that we all belong and that our time here is brief but that our impact can be everlasting if we will stay part of that circle of life. In retrospect, people go back and analyze the movie and say, oh, how clever they wove in these influences and those influences. If you really saw how the movie was put together, you would say, oh my god, you mean they did it this way? We made each other laugh so much during all these story sessions and script sessions. There was a, a great mixture of people in the room that we could bounce off of each other and write together and create together. We would be rushing into a recording session and like, you know, shoveling pizza into our mouths and sitting in the lobby going, we've got to come up with something funny for Nathan to say. And it's done very spontaneously and it's like playing jazz. And the ideas start to come together and inspire other ideas and that turns into the movie. All works of art, all great works of art, always are from a process and they're not always self-evident while you're doing them. image on the screen needn't be epic and vast and grandiose, although we try to do all those things. And one of the most compelling images is the father's paw print and Simba's little paw going into it. It had everything to do with ideas, and Rob and Roger had a strong idea about the thematic between father and son, and the son taking his father's place, and that became really moving for the audience after a while. Remember. 
we're artists and filmmakers, and so intuitively you bring your emotions and feelings to the table. We all, Rob and Roger and I, and, and so many of us on the movie had strong feelings about our dads and our relationships with our families. Yeah, my father died just a few years before I started Lion King, so it definitely was in there informing the whole thing. Okay. I know when we finished the movie, one of the things we wanted to do was to dedicate it to our fathers, to all fathers, which I thought would be a nice idea. Clearly there's an element in the movie uh, I've sort of always called the daddy issue. What have I resolved with my father? What remains? What guilt do I have that I was never able to clear up with my father? Simba has this horrible guilt that he feels like he somehow caused his father's death. And then the chance to go back, the chance to, in a sense, see his father. And we were building this idea of Mufasa returning because that idea wasn't always in the story. In very, very early drafts, uh, Mufasa dies, but that's it. And I think when we went back into our major re-looking at the story, that was one of the main things that we came up with, was that Mufasa would return in Simba's hour of need. I think that's something that internally we've all maybe dreamed of and we never really talk about, but wouldn't you love to be able to reach out into time and touch uh, your father, your ancestor, someone who came before you and say, what do I do? What am I doing wrong? Show me the way. Simba gets to do that. You have forgotten who you are, and so forgotten me. Look inside yourself, Simba. It's very cryptic, but it's really meaningful because the, you know, the, the theme then is, well, the answer is not out there somewhere. The answer is in there. I came to the studio in 1985. And it began an extraordinary journey of making uh, about five movies. Great Mouse Detective, Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, and Aladdin, and Who Framed Roger Rabbit. And it seems as if each successive film built almost exponentially in success, uh, esteem, awareness, admiration. And in that mix, we started doing Lion King. Lion King was supposed to be a movie that no one cared about. I think it was right after I finished work on uh, Aladdin and George Scribner, who was supposed to be the director in the very beginning, he gave me a call and he said, you know, there's this new project, it's kind of Bambi in Africa. That is the dumbest story I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> we are not gonna make that, are we? I'm over and over, the story of, of lions in the savanna. These are many films that people said, who's gonna ever want to see that? And consumer products would say, oh, you can't sell animals. We want people. Rob and Roger and I were sitting there going, you know, is anybody gonna go wanna see this? It's a, you know, let's face it, this lion cub gets framed for murder. We got a wildebeest stampede. There's a singing warthog. It, will it mean anything? And, uh, and throughout Lion King, um, uh, there were numbers of people that wanted to get off the movie and get on to Pocahontas. Uh, because that was perceived as that was going to be the great movie and we were the B team. It was the B picture. It was sort of the, the one that the A players weren't working on. Really, I think, I think everybody sort of felt like they would rather work on the picture that was the underdog. And then, of course, then, then you in sort of infuse that with the ragtag feeling like, okay, okay, so what if we're the B team? We're just going to rally and do, do a great job. We'll show them. This kind of rebirth of the Disney animation department enabled uh, an enormous number of talented young artists to really blossom. I mean, truly, a lot of the animators were, were always going to be under someone else on, on the bigger pictures. I mean, and nothing against the top people, because they're fantastic, but it was just an opportunity for some people to shine. I do remember that we were really struggling on Lion King, trying to find a story, because in some ways you look at the story and you think, it, it's so new. Nothing about it is, is familiar. It's, it's completely untried, untested. So you really wonder if, if alternately, you th one day you think, this is the greatest movie ever, and then the next day you're like, what are we doing? I always say that when you make a film, there's the film that everybody thinks you're making. And then as the film starts being made, it takes on a life of its own. It's like spaghetti sauce, you know? You have all these ingredients and you've got the recipe and it looks, you know, it's good, you're gonna make your spaghetti, but you really don't know what it's going to taste like until it has really sat in the refrigerator one night. <laughs> there was a magic point in Lion King where everybody believed it was going to be a great movie. 
the, uh, we, we put together Mufasa's ghost around the water hole, and you went, oh my God, this could really be a powerful movie. I think by nature of the personalities that came together and the fact that we had leadership that was inspiring us every day, um, we formed this, you know, sort of consciousness about a movie so that when you see it, sometimes you don't know really who was responsible for what because everyone built on the other ideas. And so for that part, it was, you know, as a Hollywood screenwriter who's usually like, thank you for the script, goodbye now. Um, I was very involved with aspects of the film that normally one wouldn't be involved with. Yeah, this is a considerably more collaborative process than ordinary writing, ordinary screenwriting. I think that it's a collaboration and it's also, I think, such mutual respect because you really want to impress those around you. You want to hold up your, your end of the bargain um, and you're working very hard to bring in a sequence or to create a background or a layout or a, or a, a moment of animation that's going to um, really wow the people that you respect. On uh, the uh, traditional film, you, you often have 300, 350 people at various times working on one of these films. So it's the power of 300 people with passion figuring out a way to all get in the boat and row in the same direction. We had to listen to each other, but we all enjoyed each other. I mean, we, we made each other laugh so much during all these story sessions and script sessions. There was a, a great mixture of people in the room. I mean, we had creative egos, certainly, but our egos didn't get in the way. I think you have to have a creative ego to bring something to it. You know, you have to have a point of view, and, and everybody did have a point of view, but somehow ours all meshed. And one of the rules that you have to use to go into any kind of collaboration like that is you can withhold nothing. It, it doesn't matter how bad the idea is, you have to say it. And what you find in the creative process is that sometimes that stupid idea makes you look at it in a completely new perspective and actually allows you to find the great idea, the one that was undiscovered, but you have to kind of go through that process. If you play it safe and if you do what you know will work, then you end up uh, just doing a retread of something else. The strength of uh, animation and certainly the team of artists that made Lion King is that together we made something that not one of us could have done on our own and that is a very magical thing. You know the process of creation is a miracle and there's really no recipe and there's no path that is predetermined. It is about the people, the journey, their passion and their creation that makes these things possible. two and a half weeks traveling around in, a, in an open-topped uh, Land Rover. Chris and I are sitting up there looking around. It was, we were just swept away. We couldn't, that was it. That was the moment that I realized this place is unlike any other place on Earth. Anybody who has the opportunity to go there should go there because it's, it's hard to describe. When you go there, you feel like you've gone home. And I went there and I fell in love changed my life. It was still the most amazing place I've ever been. It sounds silly, but it's such a stunning revelation to actually just see the animals in their natural habitat and to see prey and predator mingled all over was fantastic. On a daily basis, it was life affirming because everything was very raw. The, the balance of life and death was very in your face all the time. All those kind of impressions really went in also to the philosophy of the movie, the whole concept of circle of life, where you've got you know the good and the bad, you've got the life and the death cycle interwoven, the nobility of it as well. I think it informs us in so many ways. But just even meeting the people, um, the experiences that we had, it was the most life-changing experience I have ever had. That is still one of the greatest uh, two weeks of my life. It was so much fun. I mean. I've never had more fun in my life. Here it is, what, 11 years later maybe, 12 years later, we still celebrate our anniversary of the trip and we get together as a group and remember and to watch those silly videos that we took, you know, it, it, it really cemented 
not just working relationships, but true friendships that have lasted all these years. In the original production design concept, there was an idea of being much more design oriented with the landscape to try to evoke African patterns of fabrics and textiles. It made the film seem a little bit removed and made it a little bit too abstract. And so we moved away from that idea uh, to this notion that what we were creating was this epic movie and what we needed was a landscape that would be suitable for really bringing out the kind of the scale and the, and the grandeur of, of Africa. Welcome to our humble home. You live here? We live wherever we want. It's beautiful. With the background styling, I think they wanted to capture the mystical uh, atmosphere of, of this continent, you know, of Africa. I did some designs with this, you know, Kilimanjaro at the bottom of the mountain, these tiny little elephants, you know, they're passing by, and these beautiful sunsets and grass in the foreground and then some hidden animals in the background playing with focus and out of focus. I mean, there was so much you could, you could explore. It was endless. The image of the plains of the Maasai Mara, the, the broad, flat plains and the flat acacia trees has been used so much. And as we traveled around Kenya, there's such a variety of landscape. The mountains, the, the rainstorms that come over, the, all the different plant life. It was uh, really refreshing to go there and see Africa up close. And uh, all of the photographs we took, a lot of them made their way to uh, base our backgrounds on. All of our colors were inspired by Africa. Not just the natural colors of Africa, I mean the, you know, the vivid blues of the sky and the, the tan russet colors of the savanna. I don't know whether it's just because there's no smog <laughs> or what, but the colors just seemed extra intense. And we tried to bring that back into the movie as best that we could. And even little Pumbaa, you know, he's got he's bright red. Well, you'll see in some of the pictures, those little uh, warthogs were bright red. They roll in the dirt, and the dirt was bright red. And they'd come out, and they just they looked like Mother Nature had gone wrong for a second, you know, but they really looked that way. Slimy yet satisfying. We are also inspired by a lot of the tribal art. If you study Can't Wait to Be King and see Chris Sanders' work uh, and the way he stylized that and the playful kind of childlike view of Africa, it's heavily influenced by textiles and paintings and African art. It allowed me to feel okay about going completely crazy with the color and getting really bold and very solid with the color. The place itself, Africa, has a weight to it and you could embody that in the color and the production design in its own way. And if we took one thing back from Africa, really that was it. And it manifested itself in The Lion King as bold emotion, bold color, and really bold choices no matter what we were doing. Oh, I just can't wait to be king. If you look at the end of the movie, which is very kind of uh, epic and profound and the movements of weather patterns and all, that is, it's an odd mixture of what we observe from Africa mixed with kind of King Arthur mythology of, you know, with the good king comes the spring and the bounty and with the bad king comes the, you know, the rain and the drought. And those kinds of like seasonal movements are as much influenced by Africa as they are just by kind of classic mythology and storytelling. That really is about trying to distill something and trying to heighten it and trying to mythologize it. The communication is that it, it becomes real for people, not because it is literally real, but because it captures the spirit. It's so interesting that no matter how much experience people have in the movie business, nobody knows how a film is going to be received. And in the case of The Lion King, they, they just didn't know for sure. It was when audiences first saw it that it became evident that this was not just another Disney cartoon feature. It had a life of its own all the way through the making of it. And to tell you the honest truth, when you got to the end of the process, you were a little perplexed as to what it was going to do. I remember the last thing that a lot of people said, including myself, right before it released, this is either gonna be huge or it's not gonna work at all. 
You always want things to be successful. You don't work any less hard on a failure. You don't give any more blood and sweat and tears on a failure or the success. And why one succeeds and why one fails is the miracle of creation. No one ever dreamed that it was going to have this kind of success. But, uh, you know, just everything changed and it just took on a life of its own. I mean, the, the picture came out, it stayed for a long time, it, it went away for a while, it got re-released because we didn't have a Christmas slot, and boom, it was on everybody's top 10 list. As you know, if you missed it the first time, go see it. This is, a, this is really amazing. In the entertainment business, occasionally, once a decade, sometimes never, you're part of a cultural phenomenon where the where it becomes the end result becomes greater and and more significant than you ever thought it would be it's become a part of the culture they change their way of going just a little bit as they go from country to country and and kind of become the property of whoever has it there i don't think i realized how big the lion king was it is a huge name and the fact that it's the lion king is i mean it's, it's just one of those things like my fair lady that everybody's heard of it is an extraordinary journey of hundreds and hundreds of artists that have touched the hand of lion king and then later of course people would come up and say why don't you make another one of those and i'd see if you thought you know that we knew how we did it we'd be making them every 15 minutes it reestablished if this needed reestablishing that the animators who were working for the Walt Disney Studio at that time in the 1990s were the best in the world. I think for the first time we felt legitimate. We felt we had crossed a barrier from children's entertainment to entertainment. One of the startling things about working in animated movies is this sense that they don't really age. It's a startling thing to realize that people who were children when they first saw it actually now will have their own children who they will show it to. And there'll be a new medium delivery and they'll show it to their children. I'm watching my daughter just be, you know, <laughs> it, it, it was a, uh, that, that's the only time I feel like it is a bigger thing than what we ever dreamed it would be. No one, I don't care who they are or what they say, <laughs> ever sets out to make a worldwide event or something that influences culture. And in fact, I think if you set out to find those things, you probably fail. Um, all you have, as one of the great Disney animators said, Eric Larson used to say, all we really have as craftspeople and filmmakers is sincerity. It's our gift to the audience. And so when you try to put that across, people feel that. One of the happiest experiences of my life was doing The Lion King, the whole project, the four year process of it and seeing the end result. This was a home run from the word go, and I think it's because of all the people involved. And I was so proud to have been a part of it. This had something that appealed to people on a, on a deeper or more fundamental level. Father! Remember. Don't leave me. Remember. I think with Lion King, there were just a lot of elements that sort of came together right at the right time, and, um, and it was really powerful. Suddenly, what seemed like a huge group of, you know, hundreds of people working on a movie seems very small when you think of this group of people in a warehouse in Glendale, you know, creating something that has, uh, that has moved people. There was a letter that was um, sent to Disney by a man who had lost his wife. And he said, I didn't know what to tell my child. Too young to truly understand what death was. And he said, what I did was I tried to explain to them that mommy was gone, but mommy was always looking down on them. Sorry. <laughs> it was just really touching. And I think when our films do that, it makes it all worthwhile.
the script is written, so we have pages of script, which yeah. we're taking you know, for a scene or a sequence, and then give it out to the story artist and actually talk it through. And then they go away and, and draw it up as sort of, you know, it, it's sort of comic strip style. And then we come back and meet and look at what's been done and then really work with it. It's very sort of uh, s sculptural because you're actually working with material in front of you and you actually deal with whether the ideas are coming across in the boards and you sort of build in levels. They're really flexible, so you can take out that which isn't working, that would keep what is, build on it, and it's, they're idea sessions. As every time we go through a board, everybody kind of jams, story jams on it, and different ideas come up, and the energy that gets started builds the boards. It's, right. It goes over a long process, and it's enough to tear your hair out sometimes. Yeah. But, uh, but that's really the important process, because it's in those meetings that you actually discover what, what the story is, how the sequence is going to play, and that's where everybody who is involved in that process, and it's really sort of a handful of people, um, really gets to understand and know, again, who the characters are and what the story's about and how we kind of continually refocus it. Of course, everybody contributes, and it gets shaped along the way, but... Right. Uh, but it, it's a little bit, I mean, it's just in terms of filmmaking, you know, where it's different from, let's say, a live action film where you actually get the actors in front of a camera, you tell them what to do, and they're actually acting it out. It's filmed, what, and, and then later it's edited. What we do is sort of in reverse. We actually edit the movie. We write the movie, then edit the movie first in storyboard form, and then once we actually know what the individual shots are, and we actually know each and every shot, so there's no wasted, wasted amount of footage. You know exactly how you're telling the story, sh literally shot by shot, and then you have to go through all the processes of animation and layout and uh, color in order to put that together. So you work sort of from the outside or from the, from, you know, from the largest to the smallest. There were a bunch of different directions that we were thinking about going. One was the National Geographic approach, deliberately realistic and kind of uh, underplayed in, in scope. And then there was a more broad, cartoony type of effect, and then there was a kind of a Sleeping Beauty illustrationy approach, and all